All right. Awesome. For those of you just joining us, the last words you heard were Beanie Babies, which is a great introduction to our IDE lunch seminar speaker today, Scott Commoners, who is faculty in the entrepreneurial management area at Harvard Business School, teaches a cool course called Making Markets. And he is going to finally tell us once and for all whether this whole crypto web three thing is a bunch of people trying to sell Beanie Babies to each other or if it is more than that. Um, Scott, after thoroughly uh, you know, bastardizing your intellectual intellectual content over to you. Thank you very much. That's actually not that far off, honestly. <laughs> um, you know, had I thought, like, I, I will apologize. I don't have any images of Beanie Babies here, but, but they are def that's definitely sort of like an important framing question for the exercise. Um, thank you guys all for tuning in. Uh, I'm really honored to be here speaking. Scott, can I do one assets. tiny bit of housekeeping? Oh, please sorry. go for it. Housekeeping. This before. Um, yep. Scott, as you can probably tell, enjoys kind of a freewheeling interaction style. So please feel free to ask questions during the seminar. If you do so, feel free to un, um, unmute yourself, uh, show your video. But in general, let's keep video off until the end so we have a cleaner recording. And once again, Scott, I apologize. Over to you. Yeah. Thanks so much. This is a clear demonstration that I like, you know, freewheeling, you know, conversation with interruptions as appropriate. Um, so yes, exactly. Like, uh, I'm super honored to be here talking about digital assets and market design. And I really want this to be a conversation. Um, you know, this is, uh, you know, as I'm about to say on the next slide, like really evolving thinking, this is extremely preliminary. Um, and this has been a space in which, you know, a, a space that moves at, you know, 10x light speed or something like that. And you know my engagement and, and sort of view frame into it has has been constantly shifting and like my thinking has been been changing all the time. Um, I'll be you know we'll we'll be monitoring the chat for comments and questions. Like also just feel free to like unmute and like shout out or like hit the raise hand button if you want. Like um, you know really you know this is this is a lunch seminar. I want it to be a conversation. And I'm gonna like tell you some things that I've been observing. Um, but as I say, this is all very, very early stage. Um, and it's, it's, you know, probably raising more questions than we're answering. So um, we're going to talk today about the role of digital assets, and to a large extent, the role of blockchain infrastructure and in enabling them. Uh, we're not going to be tied to any specific technology, right? Like I'm not, you know, here to talk about like the Ethereum blockchain or Solana or something of the sort. Um, it's more about like from a, you know, technology infrastructure and standards perspective, you know, how we should think about blockchain and enabling new types of transactions. Uh, and then in particular, what the impact on interoperability and portability will be and how that will change platform competition and strategy. Uh, as I say, my thinking has been evolving and it's been evolving in conversation with many, many, many people. Um, in you know, sort of both inside and outside of the, the crypto space. Um, there's a larger set that I can possibly enumerate, but the the, the specific insights I'm gonna be quoting uh, today like are, are from a series of like joint papers or papers in progress uh, with a bunch of different co-authors, um, Christian Catalini, Jad Esper, John Hatfield, Ravi Jagadisan, Steve Kaczynski, Lee Jin, and, and others in progress. But these are, these are the ones that are uh, sort of currently in something resembling a final form. Uh, I want to emphasize one more time that this is all a work in progress. Uh, this is much less formal than many of my talks, as evidenced by the fact that there will be pictures in the slides, which is uh, you know very rare. Uh, and uh, and then there one thing that will not be is like a formal theory model. Uh, although there are sort of uh, I do have a couple of different theory projects ongoing that that build and make precise some of the intuitions here, especially the things I'll talk about at the end around vampire attacks. Uh, also important disclosure: uh, I hold a wide variety at this point of NFTs, non-fungible tokens, and a, and a small number of other crypto assets, but I mostly, but mostly sort of like all of these things are, are for their utility and for their like, you know, to some degree research value and like learning how these ecosystems work, uh, not so much as investment assets, but, but I do have them. Uh, and then I also advise startups and investors in the NFT space. Um, and just to give you a, a sense, you know, sort of here are some examples of NFTs that I that I own. Um, this is a, a SUPDUCK, uh, which is part of a, a series of 10,000, um, you know, kind of trippy, um, you know, sort of ducks. Um, this is a Hungry Wolves Runts. So one of the, uh, you know, one of the NFT projects I advise is a, you know, blockchain-based collection of wolves and sheep. 
that engage in a, you know, sort of the wolves engage in a challenge for dominance, uh, you know, eating sheep. So it's a, it's a game based around these NFT assets. And then another one I advise is uh, Thingdoms, which is a, uh, you know, a collection of these sort of, I don't know, characters. Um, and they're sort of like associated um, both online and offline sort of spaces and engagement created around them. Um, this is, this is and, and all three of these, this is actually like part of the, the story. We're going to like first just think about like what these digital assets are. All three of these are specific NFTs that I own. Like I pulled them out of my own portfolio. And among other things, I have the right through my ownership rights to license them for use in a talk uh, such as this one. Uh, oh, also quick footnote in case anybody is curious. Uh, the Thingdoms have uh, a series with like sweaters around the different letters in Thingdoms, T-H-I-N-G-D-O-M-S. Uh, any resemblance to, uh, you know, sort of a, a sweater, you know, for a certain Crimson institution is literally accidental. These were randomly generated from a set of characteristics, uh, but but I, I do like the, the fact that he has a Crimson sweater. Okay, so what is a digital asset? Um, I'm going to give one, you know, I'm going to use one of these as an example. There are many, many types of digital assets, but, but here's one. Uh, I can scroll. There we go. This is Supduck6484. Um, he's part of, as I said, a collection of 10,000 images of ducks that were, uh, you know, sort of artistic, like cartoony ducks that were generated randomly at the time of um, minting. So they were created on the blockchain. So they were, it, it wasn't like a set of artworks that were like in existence that were then somehow sold, but rather like people engaged in blockchain transactions that caused these ducks to be created. Uh, and, and it literally, it assembled a set of traits and like made this image of a duck. Other ones have different hairstyles, different hats, different clothing, um, different expressions and so forth. Uh, oh, and different backgrounds. And what does it mean to say that I own it? Well, uh, this duck did not originally belong to me. I wasn't the one who created the original blockchain asset, um, but it was you know, sold to a friend of mine who then sold it to me. Uh, and the process of a sale is that, you know, I send cryptocurrency, or the buyer sends cryptocurrency through the Ethereum network, and it's sort of exchange, right? The network sort of processes, you know, sort of as a stored, you know, sort of a, a stored record of an exchange of the token associated to this duck to the new holder. But like, what is what are, you know, again? Sort of like that's that description sort of creates more questions than it that answers, right? What on earth does that mean? So what it really means when I say that I'm the owner of Supduck 6484 is that I have a crypto wallet that contains a token, like a blockchain record, uh, that is associated to this image and, and that has the meaning that I am the owner. Now, again, right, this, is, this, this, this statement, it was is very weird, um, and it took me a long time to understand like what this statement could mean in practice, right? Like I um, you know, I originally was sort of ex first exposed to NFTs and was like very confused by them. Um, I actually like first got to become involved in some of these communities because I wrote like a puzzle column that referenced them. It was sort of like framed around the concept of an NFT, but I didn't understand like any of you know, I, like I sort of didn't have like sort of an understanding of of how these you know how they actually worked. Um, and some people from the Subduck community reached out and said, "Dude, like you, you should get a Subduck. Um, when you acquire a Subduck, what you're buying is a token. The token is associated with the image. The image, in this case, does not live on the blockchain. It lives on a distributed file server. Um, although some NFT images do live on chain. Um, but like, what you really hold is sort of like a digital deed that says you're the owner. Like you, you the person who holds this token, own that duck." Uh, Minkai, do you have a question? I uh, no, question. I don't. I don't okay, have one. Cool. No worries. Um, but so ownership conveys like some actual rights, right? So like, um, even though like the thing I have is this token. Actually, first, let me before before I say that. So the fact that you own this token is still defined, you know, isn't of itself as like defining a concept of ownership, right? Like digital art in general has the problem that you can just make copies easily, right? Like, you know, I can download a copy of it. Um, 
and anybody else could download a copy of it. And indeed, if you wanted to download Subduck 6484, the image is on the internet, um, you know, and you can just copy one to your computer. Um, and that makes it very difficult to define the concept of an owner, right? Like, you know, if someone is a digital artist who creates images of, of cartoon ducks and like sends them to people, uh, it's a little unclear what it means to say that I've given you ownership of the image. Uh, because like, what is the property, right? Right. If like you can make infinitely many copies for free, uh, then like, how do you, you know, sort of exclude somebody else from like also owning your duck? And the token solves that problem, right? It's sort of an agreed upon, you know, it's, it, it, it starts at literally as a convention, right? Like a lot of non-fungible tokens are just like, you know, just represent ownership of art. And what they really are is a convention that says that the, you know, the person who holds this token is the owner of this artwork. Now, of course, that's like, you know, on the one hand, like a lot of people think that sounds totally wacky. On the other hand, that is, of course, like what we do with land too, right? Like the way we establish ownership over land and lots of other assets that you can't just like physically hold um, is, you know, we establish a convention about like what it means to be the owner of it. And like some sort of institution or entity certifies that you are the owner or that ownership has changed hands. That's what like title insurance is about. Ah, the question is who determines price or value? We'll come to that very soon. Um, it's a great question, Paula. Um, but the other thing that's interesting about at least the, the subduct tokens and many of these is there actually are sort of like direct, you know, sort of tangible forms of utility as well. So like when you have this token in your crypto wallet, you can connect your crypto wallet to a variety of different like web pages and apps uh, to access members only chat rooms. So like you can hang out with the other subducts holders, um, attend like in-person events, like they hold parties that like having the token is the access is sort of ticket. Uh, and then as they're building out like a, you know, an online game that you're going to need these tokens to participate in. Um, yes, Hongi, go for it. Sorry. Uh, so would you describe this as a version of a club good within like economics kind of framing? Yeah. Or is so, it so at least in the, exactly like these are, these sort of have the roles of, of club or community goods. And, li and literally what you see is you, you form these like, you know, like a lot of them act as like a, a membership sort of in a, in a community that forms around them, right? You sort of like, you know, have this shared text that you're all enthusiasts about the same brand or the same concept. Um, and this is sort of your, your way to connect and, and sort of commune with other people with that shared interest. Uh, and, and then, and to build more on top of it. Um, great question. Um, and then also in the case of these docs, you actually get the intellectual property rights. So additionally, like if you can certify that you are that you hold the crypto wallet that holds a given duck token, you have the IP rights. Like I can license them for use in talks or uh, you know sort of inclusion in case studies. I could even build my own commercial entity around this duck. Uh, and while I while I, I haven't quite figured out how to how to really monetize my my suck ducks intellectual property, other people have done this. Um, you know, there's. Uh, you know, there are other NFT brands that people have like built spin-off coffee brands about, or even like, you know, large companies. There's a, there's a, you know, the Board Ape Yacht Club is one of the top NFT projects. And there's a, a sub-brand called Jenkins the Valet, which was built off of the intellectual property associated to one Board Ape token. And then because these things live on the blockchain, they're also sort of, in some sense, software. Right, so like somebody can find all the people who have these duck tokens, and, you know, and and give them other things. Right, they can like airdrop or or like give them some free uh, add-on or sort of extend the software to do new, new things. Yesterday, the uh, the ducks got the ability to like gain these wacky animations by interacting with a different set of NFTs called Mega Toads. And then the last thing, and this is in some sense, so it's to me like one of the most surprising things that these, you know, sort of tokens could, you know, sort of have started doing, subducts are also yielding assets. So every day they're an annuity that pays out an internal currency called Volt, which, you know, you use to like do things with your ducks. Um, like, you know, this, this, you know, toad interaction, like, you know, requires Volt. Um, and it's sort of used as a currency inside the, you know, sort of the, the world that the subduck holders have created together. Um, and people like literally exchange it for certain goods and services. Um, like I, um, you know, I have traded Volt for like artistic variations of my duck to use on like sort of associated with holidays. 
or, um, you know, other people have like used, you know, like send Volt back and forth as, you know, sort of, and, and, and donated to charity campaigns. Um, so there's really like a surprisingly large amount embedded in this digital asset. Uh, and all of it is facilitated by the fact that we can define a unique owner. And that owner is like, in, that ownership is encoded through a piece of software that people can upgrade and interact with and, and excuse me, and like read through this like public ledger infrastructure. So we're about to get into like sources of value and like why this is useful, but let me just quickly pause, you know, on, on concept. Cause like this, like it just took me forever to understand like how these communities even like use these assets, like what, what they are. And we're going to, we're going to talk about why those generate, why it generates value and stuff. But like, is everyone like any questions just about like what the heck this means? All right, cool. So why is this valuable? I already hinted at this, right? Like if you're a digital artist, for example, and again, like I don't want to like, the scope is very much not limited to digital art, but it's actually, it's one of the easiest use cases to explain because it's one of the ones that's sort of like most like an immediate from the technology. And so it's like not, it's both easier to explain and it's, it's not surprising because it's so direct from the technology that it's really been sort of a, you know, one of the early breakout use cases. In order to have markets, we have to have property rights. And clear property rights have been, a, or establishing clear property rights over digital assets has been a problem since like the invention of digital assets, right? Um, you know, not just digital art, but music has been a huge case. Um, you know, individual like software downloads, um, you know, anything where like zero marginal cost to replicate and, and significant difficulty in certifying whether you have the original or a replica, um, it's very hard to have a market in because like, how can I engage in a contract to like, you know, or, or in a transaction to trade it to you, right? If I, you know, if I just like have a copy of an image of a duck on my computer and I say, look, I'm giving you the image, I email it to you, but now I, you know, I am no less able to, uh, you know, sort of own the image than, than I did before. Um, the, uh, yeah, so, and then this is a big part of why, at least I think, and or I've come to conclude, this is a big part of why the current digital economy is so much more based on services and then like narrow centralized platforms that manage their own internal digital goods ecosystems. Because that's what you need. You need like a certifier of who owns what, right? Like if, you know, I, you know, on Amazon Kindle, if I buy a book for myself, that's different from if I gift a book to my friend, right? And, and who adjudicates whether I own that copy of the book or my friend owns the copy of the book? It's Amazon, it's their central server. Um, or alternatively, like, you know, if you, you know, if we all sort of like wanna share this like zero marginal cost music, the efficient way to do that is through a service that's optimized around streaming rather than like people buying the individual uses. Um, and we're getting, incidentally, so questions in the chat. So first of all, can you make a song NFT? Very much, yes. This is actually, um, and, and not only can you make a song NFT, but you can do really interesting things with them already. So um, people have created song NFTs that like generate royalties, like that send, like sort of require paying a small transaction, like a micro transaction fee to play them. And they automatically route that to the crypto wallet of, you know, the owner of the song NFT and uh, with, a, with a royalty also to the original creator. So because this is software, you can like, you know, create an NFT of a, of a song, an artist can sell them to their first 10, you know, big fans. And those fans can then like, you know, literally license them through the technology um, and accrue royalties themselves and royalties back to the original artist through the act of playing it. This can all be sort of embedded in a single piece of software. Um, and then, uh, yeah, there's, Exactly. So questions about centralizing trust, that's going to be huge, right? So the infrastructure is going to provide trust layers in the definition and ownership of the asset, but that just pushes the trust question out to like, what does the asset entail? What does it give you? What are the off-chain and on-chain components? Um, and, and so we're, we're already starting to see um, both decentralized and centralized solutions picking up to try and sort of solve these trust questions. Um, and then people ask like, what incentives do the project owners have to keep, um, Muhammad asks to, to keep adding functionality, right? Like why are the Subduck's creators creating a boardwalk themed metaverse game? Um, 
It's a great question. Uh, and, and some NFT projects do not, right? So some NFT projects are literally just producing art or music or, or tickets or whatever asset they're producing. The, the entire project is to produce that asset and that's the end of the story. Um, and people still like buy and sell those things, right? Like, you know, most painters of, of you know, of, of like contemporary paintings do not then go on to, you know, provide, you know, supplementary like ancillary services to the people who bought their paintings. Uh, and yet people still buy and sell those paintings and trade them and display them, right? Like, you know, so, so you don't have to have these like additional features. Um, and, and, you know, you, and, and if, you know, if we're playing the Dianu game, right? Like just the members only chat room might be a thing, right? Like it's already like, you know, in, in some ways like more functional than a painting that you just put on your wall once you can like interact with the other enthusiasts and sort of form that community. Um, but indeed, a lot of the creators of these assets are viewing them as, you know, sort of, if you could think of it a little bit like a sort of an early equity stake in like a broader product ecosystem, right? Like the guys who run Subducks, like they think of their competitor not as other NFT projects, but like in their, in their heart of hearts, they're competing with Disney, right? They want to create like a whole product and brand universe around these characters. And these early adopters are like, you know, you could think of it as like they sort of, they, they, they bought what they hope might one day become like, you know, an, you know, the early Mickey Mouse image. Um, but also they get to co-create the brand, right? So, you know, by using, you know, by, by using the intellectual property and like building things along with the other community of holder, with the rest of the community of holders, you actually sort of like jumpstart that brand and start to like show it to people and, and give it life in a way that, you know, the creators sort of like curate but don't, but sort of don't completely control. There's like a, a a blending between fandom and and canon in a way that like you know Disney frequently you know does you know sort of does not do, or typically does not do. Um, so so and 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 as a side note, in terms of like revenue, right? Like uh, the other thing is to the extent that you create continued interest, a lot of these collections and indeed the sort of the underlying NFT standard have royalty standards built in. So like as people buy and sell the subduck images. Um, you know, some amount of royalty flows back to the original creators to, to fund the ongoing project. And so to the extent that they can create growing and, and increased interest that grows the value of the assets along with the value of the brand, they also internalize some of that benefit, um, as do their holders, right? So the, the creators internalize benefits in a way that they might not with other types of work. And like if you're an early adopter, you internalize some of the benefits as the brand grows, right? Like if you are the person who discovers the new musical artist, maybe you buy three of their NFTs and now you share in the licensing revenue instead of like, you know, a centralized intermediary like a, or, or agent like a um, uh, label doing that. These are great questions, by the way. Um, so we've, we've just seen like, you know, sort of, two different sources of value starting to emerge, right? One of them is functional value. Like, you know, I can display the image, I can play the song, or I can build something around the IP, all of these ways in which like I get direct utility from owning the asset. And then the other is that the communities that form around the assets um, sort of shape the assets meaning and value, right? Like in the same way that like, you know, if a lot of people decide that some given artist's work is really interesting, like that drives up the value of the artist, you know, both among them, and potentially among other people they might share it with because they share it, they, um, you know, they generate more enthusiasm. Um, but here also the community might, you know, sort of build value directly, right? Like if you're a, if you're a Subducks enthusiast, you might be holding like, you know, local meetups for other Subducks holders. Um, and this communication channel among the enthusiasts is actually like particularly crucial for that, right? Like, um, you know, one existing pre-existing brand that's leveraged this just incredibly uh, is the Hundreds, which is a, a streetwear brand run by Bobby and Ben Hundreds. Um, the uh, they released a, a set of NFTs called the Atom Bomb Squad A D A M, not A T O M, uh, named after and, and sort of designed after their their mascot, the Atom Bomb. Uh, and this had this sort of miraculous effect, which is that. You know, they've always had a very, very engaged set of brand enthusiasts, right? The people who buy the hundreds, like, you know, many of them like really love the brand. They spend a lot of time interacting with, with the founders over Instagram and other sort of like social media platforms. They're, they're, they're major brand evangelists. 
but they didn't have a way to like co-create, right? They didn't have a way to communicate, to like discover each other um, in, in a unified and organized way. And that's what these NFTs did. They sold like a very large number of them, larger than many other collections. Um, but it's formed into this like incredibly energized community of brand enthusiasts, which grows the value of the overall brand. Because now you have more people like, you know, sort of coming up with things you can, you can do with it, uh, organizing events, telling their friends, sort of showing the brand off and, and literally building things to get, you know, to give to each other, like new, like new NFTs for, uh, you know, you know, for people who hold a lot of them or like, you know, radio show spots and like, you know, sort of other like favors and, and exchanges. Um, and so this is sort of where the value starts to get determined. It's not entirely, so, it, and, and some of this is like, you know, this all of course feeds into price. It's not like perfectly linked to price, right? There's still a ton of speculation. This is a completely novel asset class and like the real sources of value are not well understood by even the participants in the market. And so like price is not perfectly like reflective of value, but there is underlying value here. And like, you know, and at least again, you know, I haven't, I haven't run the regressions, but, but there does seem to be like a sense in which the project's prices at least co-move with value, right? Like as, as the sort of the community or the creators find new things for that they can do, um, this does drive, you know, more demand and that drives higher prices, right? Like as it becomes more valuable to be part of the Supdux or Atom Bomb Squad community, more people want to be a part of it. Um, one other important footnote here, and this is, um, this is from a piece that Christian Catalini and, and Ravi Jagadisan and I wrote, is that non-fungible tokens are particularly powerful in this respect relative to cryptocurrencies, right? So a currency is only useful once it's sort of, you know, at least to the extent that it could be a medium of exchange, it can only be useful once like a wide range of people are willing to accept it as exchange for, in exchange for goods and services, right? Like currency sort of by nature has to be broadly usable. Non-fungible tokens by contrast really only need to start with agreement about value among the set of prospective holders, right? Like a small community of enthusiasts can say, wow, we're really into this thing. And like, if, so long as they ascribe a lot of value to it and attach, like, and again, even just like the, the moment of like sort of the, the conceptual agreement that owning this token means owning this asset, right? Like many people in the world, like don't think cryptocurrency means anything. And like many of them also don't think that like owning a, a given, you know, owning that token means I own the subduck, but it doesn't matter that the average person on the street thinks it's like sort of ridiculous that owning this token, you know, could, could, that I could think that owning a token means owning a subduck. So long as all the people in the subducks community and like all the people who might ever want to be in that community think that owning the token means owning the subduck, that's good enough. And that's a much smaller set at start and it grows outside rather than inside. Um, Rather, uh, sort of, it grows out from the inside rather than in from the outside. Uh, question is: As a researcher, what are the main sources of observing value? Can anyone join an NFT Discord server? Is a GitHub equivalent? Great. These are great questions. So, um, first of all, like most NFT projects, one can just straight join the the Discord server or you know and, and follow their Twitter feeds. They do a lot of like public promotion, um, although they typically have some channels that are only accessible to holders. Uh, there's like a lot of sort of public information. Most of their like announcements are public, like, um, and so, and a lot of the community engagement goes on in the public parts of these servers. Um, there isn't really a GitHub equivalent to track all NFT development milestones, um, but you can, but as far as like the projects, once they're launched, all of this is like on the, you know, for the ones that run on public blockchains, it's all on the public blockchains. Um, and so you can see like, you know, and, 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 there are, and there are even ex already some existing aggregators that like track sales data and like sort of, you know, daily prices, you know, sort of average prices and things like that. So there's actually a surprisingly large amount of information about the transactions, at least that have happened. And, and even these sort of token token interactions, right? Like every time a duck interacts with a toad that also shows up on the blockchain, uh, believe it or not. Um, the thing that there's no good source of data for that I'm aware of is just like, the specific forms and categories of utility that these different like NFT projects offer. Um, I don't think that's been well tabulated at all. Uh, although I think it would not be that hard. Again, they're, they're pretty public about it. And 
they, they present the information, at least at the moment, in like reasonably similarly structured ways. So like it would not be a hard thing to like human scrape, but but I don't know of any good repositories for it yet. Um, and yeah, I should say, so I, I, I do a lot of casual ethnography, like looking at the, the public, you know, I'm, I'm in many, many more discords than I am involved in like projects. Um, in part because like watching the way these different communities interact is like really informative and like how the creators interact with their their communities like this is there's like a huge amount of ethnography to be done here and, and some people are doing it but like there's 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 no we're nowhere near saturated even in just like understanding at the at the like you know ultra micro level so we've mostly so far been talking about sort of this, this membership and, and sort of like adjoint, like digital collectibles use case. Um, there are others that are sort of already in like widespread use. One of them that I sort of hinted, like this idea of like owning the original Mickey Mouse, like these digital assets also are in many cases, like the, even the, the firms themselves think of them as a, as a form of quasi equity. Now they're not equity, right? They don't come with, you know, sort of Guaranteed flows of dividends, you know, not guaranteed flows of dividends, but like sort of a, you know, a, a, a um, they don't come with a claim on the assets of the company or like sort of access to specific dividends or whatever. Um, and, and they sometimes come with voting rights, but of a very, but often of a very different form of like you sort of from like equity voting rights. Um, but by the same token, they have some features of equity, right? Like it's, it's a little bit like getting early access to equity in a, in a private company. Uh, in the sense that like as the company's value grows, as people become more interested and enthused about the brand or, or they build more interesting projects, products, um, you have an asset that like, you know, appreciates in value if, if, you know, if they succeed and presumably depreciates if they do not. Um, they can, and, and, and just as a side note, I, I mentioned there's a lot of speculation in this market, right? There's also like, you know, price discovery is very, very fast, but not super, um, I don't know, it, 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 the large presence of speculators means that prices move around wildly. Like, um, you know, you might see like five to 10 X, like mul multiplicative factors of like five to 10 X price changes in, in these markets um, the, uh, in, in like a day. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, there's a lot of sense in which like they aren't quite like what we're you know, which also like, you know, private companies, you know, sort of if we actually had like equity, like tradable equity in private companies, we might see them move around a lot too, because like an early product success or failure reveals a lot of information about the company. Um, but we're seeing more and more that these firms are treating these things really as like a, a quasi form of equity. Um, the hundreds, which as I mentioned, is like the streetwear brand and they're an established company, right? Like, like they, they, sold NFTs to their existing customers and, and enthusiasts, um, you know, after, you know, operating for decades. Um, they decided, apropos of, of nothing, right? It was, it was a spontaneous announcement to start sharing royalties as, as store credit, you know, to, to avoid being a security, it had to be like, it had to be in the form of credit to holders who held the atom bomb NFTs associated to images used in their collection, in their like new clothing collections. And that's like totally wild, right? Like these are their like NFTs of their own brand assets, right? It's their mascot um, that they are using in their own clothing collections. And they nevertheless decided to pay royalties to the holders as a way. And it's, it's sort of like they're, they're sort of slightly decentralizing their own brand. And again, the return is in people becoming so much more enthusiastic and engaged. Um, and so it's like a new way to participate in the, the companies that, that you really love. Um, question, do you think the previous trends in the arts markets will end up being good benchmarks to base investment speculation? Whoo, great question. Um, yeah, I have no idea what the, like, like part of it is like, I think the, the long-term shape of this market is gonna look very, very different from the current form, right? Like, like what is the main category right now is like, you know, these, these high end digital collectibles that are uh, out of reach and, and, and digital artworks or, or music and so forth that are out of reach of like essentially every consumer, right? Both technically and in terms of price. I don't think that's anything like what the long red equilibrium is, right? The long red equilibrium should have like 
a lot of like, you know, it should be much more like Pokemon cards, just digital, right? Like there should be collectibles that many, many, many people can own at reasonably low prices, um, you know, and, and so I don't know whether, like, I mean, this sector will continue to exist, right? Like, uh, but I have no idea whether the way to think about it is like sort of tracking towards contemporary art or like tracking towards Pokemon and other memorabilia. I don't know. It's a great question. Excuse me. And then like, um, the other thing is like, you know, we've been talking a lot about like markets and, and sort of like transaction, you know, cases where the goal of the asset Oh, competing NFT platforms with this, and your, or uh, projects with the same image. This is a great question. So, not only are there any, you know, are there many examples of this, but it's a, a standard um, fraud strategy. So, like, um, and and the intellectual property rights around it are very confusing, right? So, people have created lots and lots of collections of fake subducts using the same images. Um, and you know, but but not you know not having any of the sort of features of of owning the the, the actual asset uh, that they then sell to people who don't pay close enough attention to what's being sold and like and everybody can get tricked right like uh, and so they end up buying the wrong thing and they have like you know a token associated to a stolen image um, and the intellectual property rights or the intellectual sort of property law around this I think you know I'm not a lawyer. Nor, nor, you know, sort of, uh, you know, neither by training or, or by scholarship. Like, um, but my, like, my prior is the intellectual property law around this is somewhat unsettled and somewhat completely clear, right? So, like, using the image without rights, uh, you know, is a violation of the IP of the holders. And indeed, we're, you know, you see projects bring like, you know, sort of uh, intellectual property violation claims against these, uh, you know, these fake collections and. The platforms that manage the images or that manage the NFTs display take them down. So now you've bought like a token that like was attached to an image that shouldn't have actually been attached to, but you still have that token, but it's sort of doubly meaningless, right? Like you can see it in your crypto wallet, but like, you know, you can't display it anywhere. And, you know, it didn't, didn't convey any of the rights you might have thought you were buying. Um, but there are at the same time questions about like, you know, what is the sort of like communities forming around like fake tokens? Like, and what is, what is really a fake? So like when some internet meme happens, lots of people issue NFTs of that internet meme. And sometimes communities cohere around like one subset of those tokens. And like, it doesn't actually matter in some sense whether the image is still attached to them, but just like people agreeing that those, you know, those tokens mean the meme you know, can be enough to sort of keep a community around, you know, sort of even the absent, the sort of the underlying asset, which is a little wacky. Um, uh, and yes, uh, exactly. Like, and, and this, this sort of mirrors a lot of like sort of scam and fraud uh, creation opportunities from games and, and other cases of, of digital assets. Um, with the funny sort of feature here that again, sometimes like the scam community, like, or the, 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 the scammed community or not so much when, when, when the presence of scams, but but communities formed around like tokens associated to assets that like shouldn't really be associated to those assets, but could still have meaning. Like those communities sometimes still survive, which is a, a really interesting phenomenon that I don't totally understand as yet. Mm. Uh, let's see. Actually, I didn't. I didn't have a slide on event tickets, but but let me quickly point to that because I was going to talk about it a little bit more later, but uh, but probably won't get there. So event tickets are another really interesting use case because this is a case where we already have a digital asset running around that is just like dramatically inferior to the prior physical asset on many dimensions, right? So when you have a physical event ticket, you can like you know you go to a concert you really love, you can like put it on your wall, and maybe 20 years later you can like sell it at an auction if it was a famous concert or something, right? Like the physicality of the ticket conveys a form of utility. It's, it attaches memories, all these things. Um, but of course, also you can lose them, uh, which is and they're expensive to produce. You often have to go pick them up in person or mail them to someone, which is why of course many events have switched to email. So now instead you have a ticket over your email that like you scan a QR code when you walk in, but then like, you know, 
most people never use these again, right? Like, you know, certainly, I mean, you could print it out and put it on your wall, but they're not usually formatted to look particularly good. And people don't have like high quality printers anyway. Uh, you certainly can't resell it again because you could just print another one, right? It's, it's zero marginal cost to replicate. And so like losing physicality has actually like taken away some of the utility value of event tickets. Um, NFTs have the potential to restore that, right? By defining an asset that is the ticket that you can then sell or trade to people, you can display on your digital wall. Um, same thing as with the with the the duck images, but but also with the sort of like specific use case that they they sort of replace this like less effective digital asset that already exists. And then credentials, we're seeing more and more, um, you know, employers and institutions creating registration credentials uh, or other forms of reputation that people can take with them in their crypto wallets as like sort of serving as like the, the sort of a, a part of an identity um, that they can then use like when looking for jobs and stuff. Um, Oh yes, and uh, you know, and this point about the underlying network, as long as it's supported, yes. And this has been a huge problem throughout. So, like, you know, when one of these networks gets deprecated, or even just the servers that store the the information, right? If something's not fully on chain, the chain can still exist, but but the pointers are pointing to a server that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, then these things disappear. Um, totally right. So there's actually like a bunch of um, ongoing like engineering projects trying to figure out how to make this stuff, you know as like durable as possible in a time of like great technological change, right? Like it's not obvious that any of the blockchains that are currently being used will still be sort of first, you know, sort of central in 10 years or even five years. Um, the, uh, all that said, that's of course true of the event tickets as well, right? If your ticket is like stored on the Eventbrite portal, if Eventbrite went out of business, you'd, you'd be just as out of luck. Here at least like, you know, the asset itself might be decentralized a little bit. Cool. So very quickly, and here, um, you know, we sort of, we think of like the, the there's this question we've sort of been starting to get to it, like what is this infrastructure layer playing? And, and, and I am not a decentralization maximalist by any stretch of the imagination, like, you know, but, but what I do think is really important is like sort of the, the way in which the infrastructure here is able to reduce the cost of verifying like ownership and what the asset does, like, again, to some degree, right? Like, you know, there's this problem of, uh, you know, what are called rug pulls or other forms of fraud where people use the fact that it's easy to establish decentralized trust through a blockchain to then, you know, do very untrustworthy things, right? They like, they give everybody digital assets and then they just like, you know, sort of take away all the stuff that the assets pointed to because that wasn't really the point. They just wanted to sell the assets and make money. Um, and like, so on the one hand, this infrastructure like makes it much easier for new creators to enter at low cost um, without an intermediary certifying them. But on the other hand, right, like, you know, once we lower the cost of entry, now it's easy for a lot of people who are untrustworthy to enter along with the trustworthy. And there's like a completely different screening problem to solve. Um, additionally, the fact that the, these blockchains are, are standardized and, and public you know, from a tech standards perspective is really valuable because it's reducing the cost of interoperability and it's making it possible for people to like take their data with them from platform to platform. And, and that lowers, both lowers transaction costs because like everyone's building on the same standard, that standard, pun not originally intended. Uh, and it also lowers the costs of uh, new platform entry. And indeed it produces some like real new entry opportunities. So one thing is first of all, just like these assets are out there, right? So people have been using NFT images as their Twitter profile pictures. And Twitter now provides a feature that you can just like point your Twitter profile to your crypto wallet and it will show an image from that crypto wallet that you select and like sort of certify through a hexagonal image that you, you own it. And meanwhile, like if a new platform enters, right? So Twitter can just like point to this infrastructure that's already out there. And if a new platform enters, it too can just point to and work with that existing infrastructure, right? It's really easy for them to plug into the existing networks of assets and traders. And indeed, they can even directly incentivize people to switch over. So a more and more common um, entry strategy in these blockchain-based markets is what's called a vampire attack, where you try and you, you use the history of blockchain transactions to identify who the, um, you know, who the highest value customers might be. And then you directly incentivize them to switch to try and like suck the lifeblood out of your platform competitor. 
So this had happened uh, you know, a few months ago with the launch of LooksRare uh, attacking OpenSea. LooksRare and o OpenSea is the, the leading NFT trading platform still. LooksRare launched with a, you know, sort of you know, a value proposition that was a little bit different. So it was very similar, right? It's like another NFT trading platform. Um, it had you know, some, some better features that OpenSea had like been lacking. Um, it at least at the time had better customer support. Uh, although OpenSea customer support is, has leveled up a lot in the in the intervening period, um, but their big distinction was first of all they had a lower transaction fee, uh, two percent instead of two point five percent, which is still non-zero. Uh, but two, they said, look, we're going to reward the or, you know give out tokens called the looks token. And anybody who holds the looks token can choose to like stake them on our platform, essentially like committing to not trade them. And everyone who stakes their tokens is going to get the fees from people trading on our platform rebated back to them. So like basically they started with one of these like slightly decentralized like brand structures or product structures really. Like they, they sort of, their software pays rewards to the token holders um, you know, sort of as a function of how much trading is going on on the platform. Only, only one thing. Oh, and, and, and then they awarded looks tokens to all the people who had been major OpenSea traders, right? They said, look, if you've been, you know, if you've been trading uh, heavily on OpenSea, which we can see because we can look at the blockchain records, you get looks tokens. Uh, one thing though, to claim them, you have to list at least one NFT on LooksRare. And, and you got to do it in the next seven days. And so instantaneously, uh, a bunch of the biggest open seed traders like opened up looks rare, effect effectively open looks rare accounts. Um, and the more you had traded in open the more of these tokens you got, you could also buy them on the open market. So a lot of people were suddenly very heavily incentivized to trade on looks rare. Um, and indeed, you know, looks rare trading volume was massive. Now, footnote. It's not clear how much of that trading was sort of like true trading uh, versus wash trading. Uh, so another thing LooksRare was doing was giving rewards in the form of these tokens to people who traded a lot. Uh, and you know, there are, there are, with the anonymity of crypto, it's easy to do a lot of wash trading. And so uh, there appears to have been a lot of like, you know, sort of non, not real trading um, of, of dubious legal status, um, you know, just to claim the rewards on the platform. But also there were a lot of very large transactions that legitimately did move over. And that was in part because the fees were lower, right? Like if you're, you know, you know, and the people who were making the really big transactions were also the ones who had made a lot of big transactions in the past and thus had a lot more to gain in terms of this reward system. So these vampire attacks uh, enable us to increase competition for users with the high, you know, sort of like the high demand users um, who, and especially in a context where there's very little degree of platform preference, right? You just want to be able to like trade these assets. You don't particularly care whether you're doing it on OpenSea or LooksRare. Um, you know, those customers, you can, you can try and incentivize to switch over. Um, this is very similar, I think, to the concept of an airline status match. But here, because the layer, the, the infrastructure layer is public and interoperable, it's very easy for someone to like launch in this way with no sort of prior like experience or uh, or information about the market. Um, uh, footnote, by the way, so John Hatfield and I have been thinking about a, a theory of these vampire attacks. Uh, as far as we can tell, the impact on ordinary consumers, so not these like high roller, like big trader type people, the impact on ordinary consumers is unclear. Like uh, it, it has to do with like sort of who's on the margin and, and in, in the rewards program versus not. Um, but in any event, uh, this means that the infrastructure layer and this portability uh, really does seem like it's going to reduce network effects around you know, like data and user lock-in, uh, both because it's going to, you know, it's, it's easier to move things around and because people are going to want to be able to move them around, right? Like if I, even if I like buy some NFT on Facebook's like, or Meta's like NFT platform, I'm presumably going to want to be able to use it on Twitter too. And like, probably also going to want to be able to sell it on OpenSea. And so there'll be like consumer pressure towards like more interoperability as well given the layer, the, the infrastructure layer there supports it and that it's gonna be sort of the norm in many of these use cases. 
Uh, that doesn't mean there's no platform competitive advantage. Uh, design and know-how and, and platform integrations are all still major sources of competitive advantage, as will classic network effects be in the context of ordinary consumers, right? Not everyone is going to like care whether they can move from platform to platform. A lot of them will just use the one that's most salient to them. But then also what we've been seeing here, and, and, and John Esber and, and I have been writing a bunch about this at the moment, like there's also like really like a new type of network effect formed around this, these communities, right? Like a lot of the sort of continued engagement, even in some platforms, like, you know, like even like at the level of looks rare, uh, but especially in these like NFT communities and other sort of like groups that have formed around categories of digital assets, um, they like use the platform they want to use or they're like engage in the community they want to use because it becomes sort of almost like a part of their identity. Like they actually like enjoy being part of the group of, of users or holders. Uh, and again, the platform can control like through, through the way it rewards its communities. And this again goes back to the earlier question of like why the plat you know, why the, the NFT project would keep building stuff. The platform can like expand this community cohesion by like continuing to offer um, you know new benefits, new features, or or activities, things that sort of like build upon the shared text. Okay, so in the last like three four minutes or so, just like one more major cost that's being reduced here, and and um, Christian and Catalini and I have a, a CPI tech reg uh, piece about this sort of these, these sort of different costs we've been looking at. The, the third sort of category of costs that this infrastructure is reducing is composability, right? Just like with other open source projects, it becomes much easier to build on top of digital assets, which like with open source, um, you know, means people can like, you know, introduce new innovations and features that grow the value of the overall sort of ecosystem. Um, so like here, very simple example is a, is a chain runner. Uh, it's a series of pixelated sci-fi characters. Um, and the chain runners community, some people in the chain runners community created a, you know, sort of a, a new layer that can, you know, take your chain runner. So your crypto wallet interacts with their software. And like it for each of the chain runners you hold created a Santa runner for the holidays. And this is a really simple example, but like it's community co-creation that grows the value of being in the chain runners community for everyone. Um, and like, you know, it's a little wacky, but like there was a ton of enthusiasm about this, right? Like hundreds of, you know, Santa runners were, were minted. Um, and this is again, like just sort of like, this is a simple example, right? Like, like the real power here is with like high level software solutions that like interact with these things in, in various sort of complex and, and you, know, inter, um, you know, interconnected ways. So blockchain infrastructure is reducing the cost of verification, interoperability and portability and composability. Uh, and as I've tried to highlight, it's really like creating this like digital goods economy that we, we kind of hoped for a long time ago, right? Like, you know, it, it was a it was a design problem that you couldn't like establish unique owners over digital goods, you know, in the early days of the internet. And that sort of like led to the, the, the sort of the, the environment we've ended up in with like centralized platforms controlling, you know, sort of defining ownership um, and uh, into a large part like managing transactions um, themselves. Um, I also see in this space like really significant opportunities for exist creating value out of these existing like digital quasi assets like event tickets. Um, and then like tremendously like new classes of digital assets, right? Like the example for this I keep giving is like, imagine if you did a summer internship and you created a PowerPoint that had like sort of an, an echo in your crypto wallet. So you leave the internship, you don't have the PowerPoint anymore, but every time the PowerPoint was like looked at in the firm, you like a little counter in your crypto wallet went up and you can now own the fact that you created a PowerPoint the CEO has looked at 10 times. Um, that totally changes like what one might think one can own of one's data, one's digital exhaust and like and the types of like business opportunities and consumer opportunities that can be built on top of that. This is not to say <laughs> this is a you know, uh, you know, there were there were in like you know sort of anything like ready for prime time, right? There's like all these challenges I haven't gotten into today, uh, but happy to talk about offline around you know sort of consumer protection, accessibility of the technology. Um, you know, we already talked about fraud and rug pulls, uh, macro challenges around the environment, around regulatory frameworks you know, for all these different asset classes and overlapping asset classes, right? Is Ethereum a security or a currency or like you know uh, you know a piece of software like? Yeah. 
Um, it's all of these things at once, which makes it very difficult to think about it from a regulatory perspective. And then uh, just a specific call out, like I've been, you know, my students have been making me more and more aware of like all the issues with existing IP challenges around existing IP frameworks, right? Like we talked about what if people steal NFT art and reuse it, but like a common trend apparently is that people are stealing non-NFT digital art and creating NFTs of it and just like selling it. Right. And so now, like, if you were a digital artist who was not interested in selling via this technology, you have to go and like sort of swat down all of these people who are selling your art, you know, with the technology, probably in anonymous ways that are very hard to, to track as well. Um, so lots and lots of design challenges as well as these opportunities. Uh, but I do think there is a real opportunity here um, as, as we take more, as we're sort of, you know, from the pandemic forward, right? Like, you know, we've been spending more and more time in digital spaces. And, and sort of using our digital identities as, as sort of who we are on the internet in our interactions and in more and more of our like, you know, actual like sort of like identity, sense of identity in our lives. Um, and I think these assets are going to like really give us a power to like own and shape this stuff and, and do really cool things with it. And, and my, my closing image here, this is, um, you know, a, a solid from Fine Digital. It's a series of digital buildings that you can take with you to whatever metaverse you want. Uh, and you can display your other digital assets in them, but you can also like, you know, interact with people. And like, I'm personally like really looking forward to being able to like hold office hours in a digital space. Like think about these like Zoom backgrounds, right? Like this was our starting to project our personalities through our digital interactions in a, in a very concrete way and visual, a concrete visual way. I'm really looking forward to being able to like have office hours in a digital space that I build. Um, anyhow, um, so that's exactly one o'clock. I'm happy to hang out and, and chat more with questions. I see there's one in the chat I haven't gotten to yet, but let me sort of like officially pause there um, and thank you guys once more for, for tuning in for all the great questions and for, for hosting me. Thanks a lot, Scott. Um, yes, I guess like we are at uh, one o'clock right now, so we may not have a lot of time for Q and A. Uh, I do want to announce that for next week, we have the CMO Summit at MIT, which means that we don't have an ID seminar. And the next one will be on May 5th, which will be presented by Christina McElrin from the University of Toronto. And yeah, I guess, Scott, that was an amazing talk. And I hope some people can sort of connect with you offline if they have further questions. But I think you addressed a lot of questions uh, doing a talk through the chat. So that was very productive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Yeah, so much. Um, and yeah, please, please get in touch if you want to chat more. Um, uh, scommoners at hbs.edu or at scommoners at Twitter. Um, I'll just I'll, hang on. I can just put the Twitter account in the uh, uh, in the chat. Awesome. Thank you so awesome. much. Looking forward to talking more. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Scott. See you. Be well. Thank you.